I'm originally Romanian. My name is Flavio. It's pronounced like F L A V I U. It's pronounced as as written. I'm a senior software engineer at Dino Therapeutics, a, a biotech company based in Watertown, Massachusetts. I work on all sorts of infrastructure and ML things at Dino. I take my coffee black. Um, I sometimes go for espresso or like long americanos, depending on the day and what's available. I'm not that picky. I do love coffee though. I'll enjoy a decaf from time to time. Boom, Flavio. We had another great conversation, man. I mean, this is, it's what we do. <laughs> yes, Flavio Vadan, a senior software engineer at Dino Therapeutics, uh, who previously studied bioinformatics and computer science at uh, the University of Saskatchewan, joined us today to talk about what he does at Dino Therapeutics. And what I really enjoyed is... I'll let you talk about all the cool gene therapy stuff, but I thought the second half of the conversation where he walked us through what their machine learning platform has to look like as an internal innovation engine, because at the end of the day, they're not exposing machine learning to the outside world. They're using it internally to make their sort of virus discovery efforts better. I thought that was so cool and the way that they designed the platform to enable that. Um, what'd you think? Yeah, I mean, I knew you were going to love it. Let's be honest. This is like the uh, perfect venn thing? diagram of your likes you know machine learning biotech great i'm in <laughs> so i i really yeah. appreciate that i i like how he broke down for us and especially me because i think you already knew it but just the nuances of what they were doing exactly biotech is not my strong suit so he was able to dumb it down a little bit after i asked a few times and had to tell him to pump the brakes a little bit but that was, yeah, that was crucial. I mean, this Flavio knows what he's talking about. They built an incredible platform. He talked about what they did and the design decisions, the trade-offs that they made with that. And let's get into it. Before we get into it, though, if anyone out there is listening to this and you think you know how we can make this show better, let us know. We would love to hear your feedback. And it would mean the world to us if you could just tell one person on the internet about this here episode, if you enjoy it. What's up, Flav? It's great to have you here, man. Thanks for having me. Super excited to talk uh, some biology, ML, MLOps, this all is, the good stuff. <laughs> this is like Vishnu's wet dream right now because it is right. biology <laughs> and MLOps. I was going to say it. I was going to say it, but you said it. <laughs> Does it make it worse that I said it? it? It actually does because it's that it's that much more obvious to everyone. Uh, but no, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to have you on here, Flav. Um, I have been waiting for this episode for a while. As listeners likely know, I work at a healthcare company. I'm deeply passionate about healthcare, biotech, and whenever we have a guest on that that works on ML ops or machine learning in that context, it's like it's like a, it's like a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun for me. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, yeah, so all the feelings is mutual. We should probably get started with just giving us a breakdown of what Dino does. And where do we yeah. start? We're like, what is that? What is your role? What is the whole like download? Yeah, we can we can definitely start there. So at Dino, we're pioneering an ML AI powered approach in the field of gene therapy. Like that's the TLDR. So we use ML and lab experimentation approaches to invent and test uh, new ways to design gene therapy vectors, which are essentially transport mechanisms that can help take a gene therapy to a specific type of cell. And in short, a gene therapy is a medical modality for fixing uh, underlying genetic disorders. And the current, the current uh, best approach is to deliver genes into the body using these vectors derived from harmless natural viruses called AAVs, which stands for adeno-associated viruses. And, you know, no, these naturally occurring AAVs, AAVs don't target specific cells, organs, and, and tissues really effectively. And they're often, you know, ineffective because the body recognizes them as foreign agents and it just neutralizes them. So at Dino, we're focused on solving this grand challenge to, you know, realize the full potential of gene therapy, which will make it possible to deliver these therapies to every cell in the body. And to do this, we have an amazing team of molecular synthetic and synthetic biologists, protein engineers, gene therapy scientists working alongside uh, software engineers, computational biologists, and machine learning experts. 
to design and test these approaches that we can uh, we construct to develop um, and enable the machine guided design of gene therapy vectors. And in my role, I'm one of the software engineers working on MLOps, DevOps, um, core infrastructure and compute, and currently exploring some of the and, and working through some of the ML AI approaches that combine these things for in silico design of viruses. So when you say I have to say gene as therapy. a I studied bioengineering in college. I studied bioengineering and I took a lot of biotech courses and that was one of the best descriptions of gene therapy I've heard actually. Uh, sorry Demetrius. I had to I had to get in there and say that for all the listeners because all right, for it's a really, those really that sophisticated didn't study field. bioengineering in college. I got a few more questions. <laughs> that Vishnu probably is like, <laughs> oh that's simple. Uh, I wanna know a little bit about because there, I've heard of CRISPR and I've heard of gene editing. I'm guessing this is not anything to do with that, right? It's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think the simplest way to think of it is like CRISPR can do exactly what you mentioned, Dem, and that's you know gene editing. But what we're working on is the transport mechanism. So getting the CRISPR-based therapy to a specific organ, tissue, and and cell type. Okay. And so then the other piece is, uh, is this how I've heard about like, um, kidney transplants or actually, so it's a little bit wild, but stay with me here. I've heard about using pig organs and then putting them into human bodies and they don't get rejected because of certain proteins that they use. It, does this have anything to do with that? In, in short, not really. <laughs> All right. I just want to make sure because I, yeah. I saw a uh, radio lab or I heard a radio lab episode where it was talking about I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the uh, protein. But anyway, the, mm -hmm. the long and short well, is that no, it's not not up your alley. You do uh, something a little bit different. It's mainly just with putting these these um, genes inside of the body and making sure the body doesn't reject them. Yeah, so for, for us, the immune rejection aspect has to do with the actual virus itself um, and, and for, the, for this delivery uh, path that it has to go through. All right, and so then the machine learning part comes in where you're deciding what genes you're putting into the body, and that's all done outside of the body, I guess. Actually, the ML part comes in designing the, the virus sequence itself. Mm-hmm, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Now, how are you guys, like you've been around for a while and you've been doing machine learning for a little bit. What is, what does it look like? Can you give us a breakdown of the, the deployment? Is it mainly scientists and the subject matter experts that are doing the machine learning? Or are you also getting just the data scientists off the street to come and help? Yeah, so maybe I can give you a perspective of what is the role of ML at Dino and then, you know, kind of go from there and, and build towards who are the, the people building the platform and who are the users of this platform that enable the use of ML specifically for designing uh, sequences. Is, is that okay? Cool. Um, so well, let's start by being good ML practitioners and talk about baselines. Um, so like, like I mentioned, there's this naturally uh, occurring set of AAVs or, the, you know, these viruses that kind of work fairly well in gene therapy, but um, they lack certain features that make them actually, you know, even more useful. So like some, some can only transport the therapy that's limited in size, for example. So like there are literally physical constraints of how big the thing, like you said, Demetrius, like this CRISPR thing, like if you have something inside this capsid, it's limited in size physically. Um, so uh, of course, you have to ultimately take these design th these viruses that were designed in silico and have them you know have them be manufactured and synthesized and you you need to have them fold properly into the right shape and and other things like that. And some of these AVs target specific cell types, but they're not great. And there are just a lot of high chances actually for off-target binding which means this transport vector goes to some unintended destination in the body. And while they don't trigger strong immune responses, some level of immunity can develop, as we had already discussed. 
And this requires higher doses, but then you risk side effects with this higher dose. So there are all of these like constraints and limitations that have to be satisfied because, like I said, we're ultimately making something physical. Oh, and sorry, just to, you, to jump yeah. in there real fast. When you yeah. say higher doses, you mean like, is it a pill that somebody's taking? Is it an injection? And what is the higher dose of? It's literally a higher number of these viruses that is injected oh, into see. some, um, some organ, okay. so some organism. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of it, like, this universe of possible AAVs is actually immense because like there's so many types and possibilities of designing these things. So any approach used to address these challenges must address this incredible tough, incredibly tough problem of how do you narrow down this universe of possibilities and how do you identify naturally occurring, um, how, how do you modify naturally occurring AVs to give them their desired properties? And to be more precise, there's a part of this AV sequence that we generally work with that has about 730 characters, like possible uh, characters and there are 20 of these amino acids the molecules that actually make the sequence so ultimately you have like 20 to the 730 possible configurations and since there's so many of them you know how do you how do you choose and there are many approaches to generate all of the combinations but then you're limited by lab protocols for example which takes you back to this idea of physical constraints so you, you can't simply like play Pokemon, catch them all, and try it out. Uh, you know, within the set of possible combos, there are some things that won't work simply by virtue of like protein dynamics and whatever. And at Dino, we've published work to showcase how we can increase the efficiency of these generated AAVs using ML, which helps us model this relationship between the sequence we generate and the associated function, and ultimately guide our search towards AAVs that are not only viable physically, but they also have optimized characteristics like targeting specific cell types. So the TLDR is that ML allows us to encode this extreme level of complexity into some mathematical representation that's much more effective than simple search to generate a lot of variance based on heuristics. It's an interesting theme, actually, that I think you're touching on, which you know we had on Jesse Johnson. Uh, it's an episode I refer to a lot. He was the uh, He's the VP of Data Engineering at uh, Dewpoint Therapeutics. And in that episode and in other episodes where we've had life sciences speakers come in, there's almost this way that machine learning through its ability to uh, hoover up large amounts of data and find patterns is helping us understand biology in a way that is not possible for us currently, right? It's almost like the way that we think about biology right now is very analog. Right. In the sense that we think about, you know, discrete elements, we think about, you know, amino acids on a protein, right, Indiv as individual units. Uh, but the re in the reality, it's much more of like a uh, entropic space than the way that we think about it. And that's where machine learning uh, and the fact that biotech has massive amounts of data are very, very compatible. Uh, so I, I love hearing stories like this uh, and from companies like yours that are that are tackling this challenge because it feels like we're on the early steps of really starting to understand biology much better than we ever have had before, now that we're getting tools that allow us to do that. And with that, what I wanted to ask you a little bit about is, you know, we talked about what Dino is trying to do, right, in, in, in the gene therapy realm, sophisticated stuff. And you told us about how machine learning helps do that better than, let's say, competitors or, or the way that other people might try and crack this problem. I want to understand what does that process of machine learning deployment look like? What does that process of productionizing machine learning look like in a research oriented environment like Dino, right? It's not like you guys are going to have a product tomorrow that's on the market. That's not the way biotech works. So how do you think about productionizing machine learning at Dino? First, I'll say that I very much agree with the first perspective you outlined. I think I've heard this. I think I've heard someone in some presentations say that bi biotech is in the era of Commodore 64 or yeah, the equivalent yeah. of that era. And, and I sure. thought that's very, oh, nice. very, uh, very nice perspective. Um, so when it comes to productionizing ML at Dino specifically, which are, you have to think about MLOps, right? Like how do you take a model and 
how do you store it? How do you uh, allow practitioners to, to use it for designing these viruses? Where do you store all the associated metadata and things like that? So when it comes to you know this regime of ML ops, I have a hunch that almost every organization that uses ML and is concerned with these types of issues that you've outlined, Vishnu, follows primary, you know, different practices all over the place, and they're primarily guided by some set of principles. And you know, some of these come from CI/CD engineering, like monitoring, feature and artifact storage, metadata management, on other things like that. And at Dino, we basically do the same, and we only we we certainly only follow a subset of these MLOps principles out there. And now, at Dino, I'd say MLOps is primarily concerned with facilitating access to model training um, rather than deployments, well, at least at least for now. And, and you know, practically speaking, the this domain of MLOps at Dino is concerned with like the, the design of interfaces that support data scientists in training any model implemented in our code base, for example, for specific biological problems. You know, and you know, also like these models can be implemented in Torch, Scikit, or something as custom as NumPy exclusively. And that's only the starting point, really, because there's also access to the models once they're trained, and access to the associated artifacts and data sets, metadata about what transformations and training hyperparameters uh, were applied, and things like visual visualizing the training process. So once the practitioner is able, yeah. Quick question about that, actually, because now I feel like I'm starting to understand how Dino thinks about machine learning. So you're saying, going back to the problem again, the opportunity here is to use machine learning to learn how to better design AAVs. And what you want to do then is encourage as much modeling as possible. Right? You want to throw a ton of machine learning models, a ton of experimental approaches, and really empower ML scientists and data scientists to take a bunch of data, try models, and then be able to test those models. Um, you're not necessarily thinking as much about maybe something like uh, you know, scale or deployment in the same way that like an e-commerce company is. You're thinking a lot more about the proliferation of models. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I'd say it's an accurate assessment, specifically because we don't have external facing um, right. APIs or something like that. So to us, it's more about facilitating and enabling independence for mm -hmm. experimentation in this, for the biology problems that we have and facilitating the access to the trained models once they are trained and their use in specific um, applications. That is really cool because I think where sometimes what we hear on our podcast is about machine learning as an external driver of value creation right where like you know we'll you'll have wayfair or someone like that you know effectively serving machine learning model and recommend recommendations right but what machine learning is doing for dino is it's an internal innovation engine right it's allowing you guys to build better products internally and i, I think that's such a interesting contrast i think where I, I would love to understand is is you know for our practitioners that are thinking about the engineering trade-offs that you're making I think a lot of them, and I'm certainly sitting there and saying, okay, it sounds like you really need an internal platform. To what extent have you designed this yourself? And to what extent did you guys go with external, ex existing best of breed or best of class pl platforms, right? I mean, we talk a lot about tool adoption and I'd love to understand what your approach is there as you build your internal platform. Yeah, actually this is a, it's a great segue to the idea that I wanted to outline, outline next as to what happens once uh, a practitioner trains a model so you know once at dino specifically once someone trains or you know is able to train a model this story transitions into one that is, is primarily focused on in, uh, on integrations that facilitate other responsibilities of ml ops at dino so at, at, at dino specifically integrations are core to the value production pipeline because it's through these integrations that we have the opportunity to bind multiple disparate domains like monitoring uh, the training of models, access to storage mechanisms and things like that, uh, piper parameter tuning or whatever, and access to, for example, high scale training of many models. So Vishnu, you mentioned scale. Uh, for, for us, scale mm -hmm. is really train many, many models in parallel, right. all on like four GPUs or something like that. So MLOps overall is the glue of everything that may be needed to facilitate the practice of ML within Dynos context. That's it's really interesting. I think the way that I think about uh, some of the challenges in machine learning are data, compute, 
an evaluation, right? And, you know, from the standpoint of like, just to, it's a really rough heuristic, by the way, <laughs> there's so many more, so much more there that I know that Demetrios is, 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 is probably sitting there and thinking like, what the heck? <laughs> but when you think like a lot of times it, as a machine learning practitioner, you're, you're sitting there and saying, do I have the data? Can I train a model? And then after I train the model, like, can I just like test it? Right. And I'm, I'm kind of curious for you guys, like, can you walk through, like, if I'm a data scientist, like to the extent that you can disclose, like, what is my interaction with data? What does that access layer look like? How do I then access compute or how do I then translate data to the compute layer? And then what does evaluation look like? like can you walk through those three things? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can definitely offer you a more practical perspective to, to help you develop an understanding of how we created basically an ML platform um, at Dino. So I mentioned how MLOps is concerned with the design of interfaces to facilitate access to training, for instance. And I should be clear that we primarily use Python, just like to kind of set the tone of how these things can look like. You can imagine whatever I will say in a Python context. Now, practically speaking, if you are a user of this interface, all like something that allows you to train a model, all you're really exposed to is some function call that takes one or more of your model class specifications, like a torch model that is stored in our code base. And with that, you can specify a single configuration object that takes that, that offers you the opportunity to control characteristics such as epochs, data sets, data set transformations, where a data set comes from, um, how to aggregate gradients when you use distributed GPU training, optimizers, and things like that. And there are many defaults we use to facilitate this access so that users don't have to repeatedly do the same thing and you know only support them in only specifying a small number of hyperparameters. And once you hit play, so to, so to speak, there's some association that's made between the model or the collection of models you submit um, that, were, that, that you submit with the right training infrastructure. So we have multiple of these like vertical stacks of training infrastructure that support training specific model types that our users uh, submit. So some models are dispatched to training mechanisms dedicated to, to Torch, NumPy, or Scikit for instance. And in the case of something like Torch, you can also use things like distributed training, for example. And, and in the case of NumPy, we run custom training loops so that each of these, each of these tr frameworks has its own independent needs satisfied, so to say. And whatever library is eventually used to train a user's model, it all ends up on Argo workflows, which, mm. which is a product that has been extremely enabling at Dino because it allows us to scale operations almost to to almost whatever degree we want to, provided, of course, that we satisfy some of the limitations and exposes, such as hardware access. And all of this ultimately ends up on Kubernetes, of course, which is literally the work, workhorse of everything, almost everything we do at Dino in the computational realm. And Argo for ML has specifically enabled us to construct numerous independent integrations, um, kind of going back to the integration idea, that provide value by taking advantage of the flexibility we have with Kubernetes to run basically anything we want. And we run our own storage uh, model storage mechanism built on top of Google, Google Cloud Firestore. Uh, so models are saved automatically when users train them. We have an integration with AIM or AIM stack where we visualize experimental and production training runs. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll mention that AIM stack allows us to push metadata to it as well, which is great because we can see associations between some of the biological context with, with model directly in this platform. And for distributed training, we provide access to multiple GPUs via Horovod. And uh, finally, you can specify, for example, what metrics you want to track. And, you know, those are generally fetched from this catalog that Torch Metrics offers us, which are, uh, again, automatically tracked in AIM and automatically aggregated when performed in a distributed uh, training regime. And the glue that all of that unifies uh, all of these elements, all the way from the interface that I mentioned to distributed GPU training and monitoring, is done is done through Hera workflows, which is an SDK for Argo that Dino released last October. Okay, before we get into Hera and yeah, all of that good stuff, what does the team look like? Uh, because there was a paper that came out, I think it was like a week ago or two weeks ago, and it's been doing its rounds on. LinkedIn and it showed all it was like the ultimate Venn diagram for ML ops. I imagine you've seen it. We'll link to it in the show notes if anybody hasn't seen it. But it sounds like there's a lot going on. 
how many people are working on it? Is like the whole company aimed at this machine learning thing? Or is it like you have a separate subset of like a few DevOps people, data engineers, machine learning engineers, the data scientists, and you all are doing this crazy ML stuff off to the side? What does that look like? So I'm sitting here smiling while you're asking this question, Demetrius, because um, what you described as, you know, a breakdown of like a team of DevOps and, and MLOps and things like that, that's the ideal <laughs> situation for a lot of organizations. Yeah. Um, we are not in that position yet. So our responsibilities are kind of mixed. And like, that's why, um, you know, in, in my introduction, I mentioned how I like, I work on core compute and, and MLOps and DevOps and whatever. It's like, there's been many hats to wear in an organization of our size. So I'd say, you know, we have a fairly small engineering group and everyone has their own specializations. Um, a few of my colleagues and myself work on the MLOps side of things, DevOps and dev experience overall. There are some folks who are more focused on the data side. So how do we store data and provide access to data? Um, and then there's a group of, of scientists primarily who uh, most of them come from academia who are primarily concerned with developing the methods that enable us to design AAVs that take, and all of these methods independently, they, they can be developed independently in things like Jupyter Notebooks on Vertex AI, on GCP. But once they have to be integrated uh, with everything else that we provide in this like pipeline we have for design, then they work with us engineers to, to we, we collaborate on constructing all of these like uh, integrations that are necessary for Intr int introducing a new method into the pipeline officially, so to say. And we have this protocol because, of course, anything we make, kind of going back to the idea of physical constraints, we have to do all sorts of QC and things like that before we introduce something. So there's a lot of, it's a highly collaborative environment in which all of the groups actually work together. But when it comes to uh, what you asked, DevOps versus MLS or whatever, it's like many hats wearing, you know, we wear many hats in the engineering group. Yeah, typical startup basically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lot of fun. I do notice that you are leveraging Argo workflows, which I feel like has been coming up more and more. And I wonder why, or if you ever looked at trying to use Kubeflow uh, and why, if you did look at Kubeflow, why you chose Argo workflows, because it seems like a lot of people are going towards Argo workflows these days. Yeah. So I'll Maybe I'll give you a perspective of why Kubernetes and why Argo, and then we can go um, ahead and talk about Hera and how that facilitates access to these types of resources. So I'm not sure how uh, Kubernetes is popular, but it, it strikes me that people are still not super familiar with ex kind of exactly what it does. So briefly, it's an open source platform that supports management, the, the management, scaling and deployment of containerized applications. So as long as you can isolate your dependencies into a container, generally Docker, uh, your application or workload can run on Kubernetes. So it offers Dyno the necessary flexibility of running almost anything um, at our almost arbitrary scale, which allows us to, and you know, also facilitates resource accessibility, gives us the opportunity to move fast as deployments can happen quickly and at high frequency. Now, I'm a big fan of Kubernetes, um, but I also have the knowledge that one, uh, the one, that, that one of the downsides of Kubernetes is this steep learning curve that practitioners have to go through to understand the intricacies of it. However, I think that that learning curve is absolutely worth it, given that Kubernetes is part of CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I'd argue that when, you know, when people hear cloud first, they likely think of Kubernetes. And what's incredible about CNCF is that any project, almost, I, to my knowledge, any project that's hosted by CNCF integrates very well with Kubernetes. So again, kind of going back to the idea of integration, what's amazing is that if you're a cloud first company like Dino that uses Kubernetes, you're not only adopting Kubernetes, but you're basically adopting CNCF and anything that's hosted by CNCF can now use, be used to deliver value to your organization by integrating multiple projects into a single unified stack. And you have access to a huge diversity of MLOps tools like Katib, for example, for hyperparameter tuning and Kaser for model serving. And I attended KubeCon last year, and there were also some presentations about 
things like data set caching directly on 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 kubernetes so it's kind of this reasoning that was used when we adopted argo workflows and we knew we needed you know we knew we needed a workflow engine and we looked at airflow prefect and other things like that but none of them had really the potential to enable these second order effects that i've described that kubernetes does and for instance i will you know i believe airflow offers a kubernetes executor in v2 however if you have the opportunity to construct a platform that quote unquote speaks kubernetes through Argo and uses exactly the same constructs as Kubernetes does, I personally see that as a huge um, opportunity. So you know, it kind of goes into this idea of how did how did Hera come about and and Kubeflow and you know we can definitely talk about that next. Let's do it. I want to get into I want to get into hearing about Hera. It's uh, for those who are listening, we're definitely going to add in the show notes a link to the original blog post uh, from. Dino about what Hera is so that you can read more about it. I know Demetrius and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it, but for the sake of the listeners, uh, Flav, can you take us through what exactly that project is, where it came from and how you worked on it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll take you all the way back in time when we used Qflow and I'm using, you know, this language to like showcase how fast things move in the MLS world. Um, Cause like, you know, back in time, Qflow was is a really a young project. Anyway, so we used Kubeflow, um, but we had some challenges associated with observability specifically, especially as it pertained to image pull backoffs, if you're familiar with that term, like you're trying to pull an image and you cannot find it and, and things of that kind, and as, and also access to GPUs. In addition, the the Kubeflow pipelines as DK or KFP, uh, also, also known as KFP, turn out to have some, some of these gotchas that caused some confusion among the team especially things like serialization um, that allowed, that was used to create parallel jobs, the decorators that had to be used, and all of the parameters that people had to set. And it didn't really, it, these characteristics didn't really support our experimental independence. And as I was mentioning to you, Vishnu, like that's one of the primary aims we have in developing this ML platform. So, uh, you know, people who knew more about Kubernetes and observability paired a lot with people who um, work with Kubeflow in order to debug issues associated with the usage of Kubeflow. Now, Kubeflow is actually a very nice product for a lot of reasons that uh, your recent guest, Ryan Russon, actually actually touched on in, in his episode. And I must say that I agree with the perspectives you exchanged in that episode because, yes, Argo does feel a bit more comfortable to, DevOps and M to the DevOps and MLOps community. And to some degree, it's challenging for data scientists to be told, you know, now we're using this thing called Argo, not Kubeflow. No, but I do think there's a nice balance to strike, which is what Hera aims to ooh, aims to provide, actually. Um, you may know how Argo is configured through, you know, YAML and basically pseudo programming through YAML files, which is extremely error prone and doesn't really support independence unless you're actually familiar with Argo. Um, it's hardly testable and at Dino were way more comfortable with Python. So we use this SDK called Argo Workflows DSL, if I recall cor correctly, that was available at the time to create some core Dino workflows on Argo, deliver value through Argo Workflows when we, after we initially adopted, uh, adopted that, that project and kind of just check it out to see what we can do with it. And as we tried uh, more and more of these workflows, we found that it didn't really support the independence to the degree that we sought. We still needed to work together to create data science workflows, which is which is okay, but it provide in, it, it proved inefficient at specific points. Also, to get around some of the missing features, we had to understand the actual implementation of this DSL to know kind of what inner fields to modify so we can provide access to GPUs, for instance. But you know, once we proved the value of our Argo workflows, which was the important element, we we looked at other options to kind of provide access to it and we found cooler and i should be clear that these are amazing sdks it's just that they did not work specifically in dino's context and color was good at the time but but the parallelism and dependency model design involved using lambdas in some convoluted ways and it also interacted with kubectl which is the cli of kubernetes and we know we had some security concerns and um around that specific topic so we wrote our own after a few trials, um, designed Hera and collaborated with the Argo folks at Intuit to open source it under uh, Argo Project Labs. And the primary goal from the start was, and it will always be, 
to empower the team at Dino to be independent and in the hope and the hope of open sourcing was to empower other organizations faced with a similar tech uh, similar tech choices like you know using Argo workflows to have the same degree of independence and facilitate access to Argo. I love that story. I think it's a great example of how uh, an engineering team that is trying to meet, you know, crucial business constraints in a number of ways, right, around the flexibility and, and the, the efficiency and effectiveness of the platform that you're trying to build, uh, has to take multiple approaches sometimes, right, and prototype and some things fail, some things don't work out, but, you know, that's the whole point behind trying to, you know, solve the problem the right way, right, not just the quickest way. Um, and I think one question I have here is we are, as a community, there's a ton of energy around open source. And I think this is an interesting opportunity. You guys are a startup, you're fast moving, you have a lot of um, like business needs to solve. Like, how did you guys make time to open source this, this project? Like, how did you communicate that to your stakeholders? Like, how much work was it just so that other p other practitioners who are at companies where they want to, they want to push an open source model for some of their projects? Like, how can, can you walk through your experience so that they can understand the level of effort there? I think there are two core characteristics that, that engineers specifically have to be aware of when they would like to um, open source a specific project that they worked on at the company. And it goes to, goes to the, this idea of development empathy, which is something that I'm a big proponent of. You really have to understand who you are communicating to, uh, communicating with, specifically when it comes to uh, design of projects and open sourcing. So one of the core risks you, you, you will be, I was faced with specifically, um, was leaking any sort of private information about Dino as an organization through the an open source effort. To address some of this, I generally recommend finding champions and supporters who are sort of, you know, kind of to say on your side to push for this effort and actually speak for the opportunity that an open source project presents in terms of recruiting, for example, and things of that kind. So you have to position your pitch very, you know, in a very tailored manner for the for, for your audience. And in, 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 in a context like Dinos, it was the legal team. So we had to work together to understand what are the risks we're actually exposing ourselves to. What are the implications for what are the practical implications for, for engineers? So who's going to maintain it? How much time does that require? How are we going to take external, externally contributed uh, code and integrate it into our own practice in a, in a safe way? And who's going to be responsible for that kind of thing? And, um, and what is the overall net benefit for Dino as an organization? So you really have to be thoughtful in the way you 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 position your pitch. I, th I think it's it's all about that and finding support from perhaps more mature engineers and more engineer more experienced engineers. Great advice. I think it's actually really interesting to hear uh, that at your company it was like the legal team, right? That was sort of the core stake stakeholder here. And I think it's, it's 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 a good tip for engineers, you know, including for me to kind of think from that legal perspective and understand. You know, I never really learned all that much about some of the software licensing stuff. Right. Um, and I think it's, it's a good tip that you just gave to all of our listeners, to me, uh, around how to navigate some of the issues here. Uh, and, you know, as much as I would love to keep this conversation just going and going and going, uh, we're up against time. And I just want to thank you, Flav, for wait, coming wait, on. I got one more. I, I, there's one great... that I wanted to ask. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. It's not done yet. So... Hold your horses up. <laughs> I just want, so I wanted to go into something because you mentioned earlier, Flav, how you're following certain MLOps practices and certain ones you kind of threw out the window or you, you decided not to follow. And I was thinking about which ones those were, like which ones are you deciding to follow and why? And then which ones have you put to the side and said, not right now? And maybe it's because of the use case or maybe it's just because of the manpower or woman power, human power, uh, what does that like look like? I think whenever uh, someone, uh, so I, I, I must first acknowledge that I don't think it was a conscious choice. Like I don't want to come off as I knew everything ahead of time and like I designed it very intentionally or something like that. It was more of let's take an organization need and solve for that problem right now as it is. And then we're going to adapt and like take 
small steps and solve problems as, as they come up. And then I realized that, hey, we're, we've actually cut some corners in this, like, for, from this collection of ML ops principles and practices, and we only focused on a subset of, of, the, of the core principles. So if you know this, like, infinite um, sign that says you deploy a model, you, sorry, you collect data, train a model, test the model, deploy a model, monitor the model, revert or like and you keep going in this loop for us it was mostly about what are the current problems of the org as i mentioned and and for us it was train the model sorry access facilitate access to data train the model store the model and then use it for a bio biological problem because our experiments change from time to time data changes as, as collections come back and things of that kind we're, we were primarily focused on like a half of this infinite sign for now and as our science advances our, as our practice advances as our infrastructure advances we may end up in a in a world where they the, you know this full infinite sign is going to be fully satisfied but until then we're generally just aiming to solve for organizational and business issues mm -hmm. and only provide access to the things that people care about and we know are going to be used for otherwise we end up building things that are like nice but they're not necessarily immediately useful um, and it's, it, you know, rather than over engineer, build in small increments and then learn from that is probably the best thing we've done um, so far. Awesome. Strong fundamentals there. All right. Now we can clear it. We're going to cut it there. Thank you, Flav. This has been awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.